There is a, uh, I guess it's a pair of problems which people worry about talking about the Hasidic movement, the role of the Rebbe, and I think they touch on a general understanding of how Torah works. One is that, at least in some Hasidic um, communities, the Rebbe is asked about every aspect of life. <clears throat> and to some people it seems like what he's being asked about is either trivial, it has no relevance to anything important or serious, certainly no relevance to real Torah decisions. That's one part of the problem. And the other part of the problem is that it seems like there's no real expertise there, you know. Why would you ask the Rebbe? Why would that be the right address? Now, of course, that in part is due to prejudice, you know, that the Hasidic Rebbe's were ignorant, they didn't know anything, they weren't trained. Um, so, I think there are a few things to say here, <clears throat> and they probably sound like, at the outset, just separate separate items, but I think that eventually we can be able to see that there's a common theme. Um, <clears throat> when the Romans were attacking Yerushalayim, they had it surrounded, the um, question was what to do, to surrender the city or not to surrender the city, and if to surrender, what kind of terms could you get from the Romans? Yochum and Zakkai was the one who made the decision, although there was opposition from his own nephew, who was the head of a group of Biryonim. These were, these were people who their attitude was fight to the last drop of blood and if you don't do that you're a traitor <coughs> so much so that Yochum and Zaka had to sneak out of the city um, and he was the one who approached the Roman general and negotiated with him a kind of surrender with conditions in other words if you don't if you, if you, you won't have to fight you won't have to engage in a protracted siege you won't have to break down the walls, you won't have to lose soldiers in a battle if you'll agree to certain conditions that we have. And Rabbi Yochum Zakai was not a military general and he didn't have military experience. He was a Torah leader and he was the one who carried out the negotiation. And somebody wants to say, well, you know, let the rabbis worry about Shabbos and Kashras, but uh, leave practical things to other people there's certainly no support for that in the in the um, in the in this partic in particular case of surrender of Yerushalayim. And if someone says, "But Rabbi, isn't there a difference of opinion as to whether or not what Rabbi Yochum Zakkai what did was correct?" Yes, there is. But no one suggests that the local army commander should have negotiated instead of him. No one suggests that. It's just that there is a concept that greatest Torah scholars can make mistakes. They're only human. And there is a Pasuk Meishi Chachamim Machor that sometimes the Kodesh Baruch Hu turns the wisdom of the wise back. But nor does it say that 
since they're fallible and since sometimes the Kodesh Baruch who denies their wisdom that we shouldn't use them we should use, use somebody else democratic decisions <coughs> or a survey of the, uh, uh, you know on uh, uh, Dr. Google or th- that that certainly is not uh, nowhere is that uh, is that ever suggested um, and by the way just as a little point of logic there's a big difference between saying Einstein was human and every human being can make mistakes so Einstein wasn't perfect which is certainly correct versus saying I found a specific mistake that Einstein made and I know he was wrong which 999 times out of a thousand person says that is going to be dead wrong there's a big difference between saying someone is fallible and makes mistakes on the one hand versus saying I found a mistake I know what mistake he made and I know better than he does what the truth is about this matter that doesn't follow and it's a lot of that kind of slipshod thinking well since the rabbis are only human and they make mistakes so what's wrong with saying they made a mistake what's wrong with saying that this is the mistake and I know they made a mistake what's wrong with it it's dumb the fact that a person is not God, the fact that a person is fallible, doesn't mean you have better judgment than he does. You wouldn't do that with the surgeon. You wouldn't do that with the auto mechanic. You wouldn't do that with macrobiotic uh, cooking. Somebody spent 20 years researching the subject, you wouldn't say, well, since you're only human and therefore you could make mistakes, I think this is a mistake. They'd say to you, he has 20 years of experience and you're just shooting off the cuff, you know, after the third martini. Why do you think you're right? Why should we trust you? It's stupid. Okay, so now the question will be, well, where are these Hasidic Rebbe's coming from when they're telling people what they should do, guiding them, um, when? They aren't the most outstanding scholars shouldn't we just trust the people who are the most outstanding scholars <clears throat> now the trouble here is that the idea of the most outstanding scholar is subtle it's subtle it's tricky and it has all sorts of qualifications which are very difficult to pin down for example after Moshe Rabbeinu, the new leader of Klai Yisrael was Yeshua. <coughs> um, in the first or uh, second verse of the book of Joshua, it describes Yeshua with a certain certain term, Meshores Moshe. Meshores Moshe means the one who served Moses. That, plus, that is, is, is a quote from the Torah itself. And it says, Lo Yomish Mea Ohel, he was never absent from Moses' tent. Never absent from Moses' tent. There, Moshe Rabbeinu had thousands and thousands of disciples. In certain sense, all of Klai Israel were his disciples. And he had thousands and thousands of close disciples. And he taught them. Yeshua was one of them. No question about that. But that wasn't his claim to fame. His claim to fame was he served him. Going to Vilna on the first, the beginning of the book of Joshua is Medayik. This says it doesn't say Talmud Moshe, it says Mashari's Moshe. And he quotes a Gemara where it says, Godel Shimushan Mi Limudan. Greater is serving a Talmud Chacham than what he teaches. Godel Shimushan Mi Limudan. Gemara Brachas. That's interesting. What does that mean? Pouring water on his hands and cleaning up the table after 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 supper and so on and so on is greater than what he teaches. So the Ma'atzchias, who's a commentator, a late commentator in the back of the Gemara, makes I think a very um, subtle remark. I'm putting it in my terms, but this is this is the, the idea. Don't think that his teachings are one thing 
<coughs> and serving it with something else. It's apples and oranges. And the judgment is that the apples are more valuable than the oranges. No. What are being compared are apples and apples. There are various different ways in which a person teaches. One way he teaches is by speaking. And another way he teaches is by his actions. You probably have heard the wise English motto. You know, when a person says, do as I say and not as I do, you don't pay attention to him. You tell parents, whatever you talk, tell, say to your children, they'll watch what you do. And they'll be much more affected by what you do than what you say. So you nod your head wisely and say, yes, of course, of course, that's right. But when it comes to Torah, all of a sudden, all that wisdom goes out the window and you don't hear it. What, what Maaschis is telling us that the Gemara means, and the Gemara is quoting it, is that when you observe the way a Talmud Chacham acts, you're learning something he's teaching which you don't get from his lectures. And then the Gemara says, that which you get from observing the way he acts is greater than what you get from his lectures. Which means, of course, you must get both. Indeed, we may talk about this. If you don't get his, if you don't pay attention to his lectures, you won't understand what he does. You won't be able to learn from what he does. But comparatively, what you get from observing the way he acts is more important than what you get from his lectures. And Joshua, because he was never absent from Moshe Rabbeinu's tent, had the maximum of observing him act, and that's what qualified him to be the next leader above and beyond other people who also heard Moses' lectures and also memorized everything he said and analyzed it and, and debated it, and asked clever questions and so forth and so on. But they didn't have what Yoshua had from um, from observing him act. You want to ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Was this, what the, this comparable to what the Rav was saying yesterday about the, I forget the name of the Talmud who was uh, watching his rabbi's moves in the bathroom? Hundred percent, hundred percent. Of course it is. But I'm showing you now that it's much, much broader than that. It's much broader than that. Now, <clears throat> this is nonverbal communication. It's a, a, a study, a subject that was studied in, in philosophy to a great extent, especially mid, mid 20th century when they made the transition from behaviorism, which was completely hopeless, to a different, much more subtle understanding of human communication and learning and the content of understanding. There's a great deal that comes from nonverbal communication. And you use it. You use it in your calculations. You use it in your, in your analysis, your understanding, and your decisions. Even though its source is nonverbal. Let me illustrate this for you in, in simple terms where the nonverbal impinges on the verbal. There are certain decisions which were made by Kala Yisrael over, down through the centuries, through the millennia. Legal decisions. If you analyze what the decision is, where it came from, you'll see that it relies almost entirely on nonverbal understanding. The legal decision doesn't come from clear legal principles and legal arguments and evidence and contradictions and theories. No, it doesn't come from that. It comes from a judgment that's made without almost any verbal articulation whatsoever. Here's a law that's codified in the Shulchan Aruch. When Rosh Hashanah goes out on Shabbos, we don't blow the shofar. Why not? Why not? No, it's not Marasayim. <clears throat> in fact, Yerushalmi says because there are two contradictory verses, which indicate that you shouldn't blow on Shabbos. But the Bavli rejects that. The Bavli says the Torah tells us to blow the shofar on, Sh on Shabbos. The rabbi said don't do it. And the rabbis have the authority under certain circumstances to stalemate what the Torah tells us to do because the Torah also tells us to listen to them. Okay, I'm not going into that now. That's my, not my issue. What was their problem? What, what was their motivation for saying to blow the shofar? Because they were afraid, maybe, someone who's so excited about the mitzvah of shofar and is worried that he's not going to do it correctly, 
maybe he will want to take his shofar to an expert and blow it and have the expert certify that he blew it correctly and he will forget that it's Shabbos and he will carry the shofar through a public domain and violate Shabbos. Maybe that will happen. Okay. Maybe it will happen. But now, because of that maybe, the whole nation of Israel sacrifices the mitzvah der Raisa of shofar. Because when you blow it on the second day, it's only der Rabbanan. Who said that's more important? Who said that the mere possibility <coughs> of an inadvertent violation of Shabbos, which in certain respects is the least possible serious violation of Shabbos, and yet it doesn't have to happen. Maybe it won't happen. But maybe it'll happen. Who says that's more important than the mitzvah of shofar? Who? Yes, Shabbos is more important, but here it's the only the mere possibility of an inadvertent violation of Shabbos versus definitely losing millions of people's mitzvah of shofar. Who says that's more important? There's no legal discussion of this. And they say, but, well, you see, inadvertent is only this, and you have to bring a korban chattas, so that makes it serious, and so on and so on, and uh, maybe people in this city will be, or in that city, or... No, there's no, it's just simply, they said, yeah, this is more important than that, therefore don't do it. And it's accepted. It's not, you don't have different groups. Some say yes, and some say no. No, it was the decision that was made and was accepted. I, of course, I don't know everything that's written everywhere, but as far as I know, there's no explanation in legal terms how you get to that conclusion. You have to look at the two things and say, this is more important than that. Same thing's true with um, with Lulav. Lulav on the first day of Sukkot is their Isa. It comes out on Shabbos. Then we don't take it. It's exactly the same reason. What you see here is a straightforward legal decision. Decision about how a law should go is based on this kind of non-verbal understanding. You think about it, you analyze it in your mind, you play with the different scenarios, you look at the consequences, and you say, yeah, this is better than that. And that's all there is to it. So, and, and, I mean, this isn't, this isn't questionable. This isn't controversial. No one can deny this. So, the question is, where does that kind of grasp come from? How is it communicated? How did it... it, it the, the Jewish people absorb it. Once you realize that such a thing is nonverbal communication, and it's important in terms of Torah, it's Torah learning. That's what the Gemara is telling you. Godel shimushimi limudon, kordemaratzchis, means there are two different types of learning from the Rav, and one of it is verbal and the other is nonverbal, and one of the learning from the Rav is more important learning Torah from the Rav. So I want to suggest. a source of this information, not the source, a source, which I haven't seen discussed in, in great detail. Um, prophecy. What happens in prophecy? So, um, Prophet Samuel meets Saul before he's king. He says to him, I want you to go in such a place. On the way you will meet B'nai Hanavim. B'nai Hanavim were the disciples of the prophets. <coughs> they were prophecy school. You went off into the hills with the, with the prophets and they trained you in meditation and other kinds of disciplines. And they trained you to identify the kinds of experiences that you have, whether they were genuine or weren't genuine, until you got to a point where you were certified as a graduate prophet. So uh, Sh um, Shmuel says to, to show, you will meet the B'nai Hanavim and you too will prophesy you'll be turned over into another person. You'll become another person. Oh ho, so we are now getting a description of what happens to a person when he has prophecy. We know from the sources 
that every prophet other than Moses, when he was hit by prophecy, first of all, he lost control of his body, all of his muscles. He was flat, was flat out on the ground. He lost control of his mind. He lost control of his will. He was totally overwhelmed by the experience. When the prophecy finishes, he doesn't just get up with a, 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 a verbal message in his mind. First of all, sometimes prophecy was accompanied by visions, and he certainly remembered the visions. But he had this experience, this experience of being totally overwhelmed and possessed by Nevoah. Shmuel tells Shoal, you'll become a different person. This left a stamp on a person. A person who had prophecy doesn't drink a glass of water the way he used to, and doesn't dive the way he used to, doesn't eat the way he used to, and doesn't sleep the way he used to, became a different person. Now prophecy was very, very widespread. From the time of the Exodus, until prophecy stopped, about a thousand years later, as you've heard me say, in addition to all the people who left Egypt, there were a million two hundred thousand prophets, six hundred thousand men, and six hundred thousand women. That means every Jew who lived in that thousand years knew prophets. We've spoken about this. No, the Ramban says that no Jew went to a, to a, a doctor if he had a physical problem. That was only a symptom of a spiritual problem. He'd go to the local prophet. The prophet would tell him what his spiritual problem is, and he would fix that, and the physical problem would go away. Okay, now step back. That means everyone was interacting with prophets. Interacting with them. Well, when you interact with a person, among other things, you learn from his actions. His actions have an effect on you. So I see here a gigantic injection of nonverbal understanding in the prophecy of a million two hundred thousand Jews over a thousand year period who then embody this experience and some of them had it repeatedly over and over again <clears throat> they embody this experience and when they act in public in friendships as neighbors they don't act the way normal people act and that people who watch them and interact with them are affected by that. This is a projection of a non-verbal understanding into the people, the people of Israel. It's part of their grasp of Torah. Now, when you come to a decision like, shall we cancel mitzvah shofar for a whole year, Mr. Deiraisa, because of the possibility that someone will inadvertently carry it in the public domain on Shabbos, part of what you're relying on is this non-verbal understanding. You can't test this with book learning. Again, the book learning has to be there. Otherwise, the experiences are, 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 are dumb. They have no, they have no, you can't discern their content. But on the other hand, if you don't have the experience, <coughs> you're missing a certain content of Torah. This is non-verbal understanding, which is the, uh, one of the bases of all human understanding. I'm not saying anything controversial now. It was controversial in the 30s and 40s when they were hypnotized by behaviorism. But when they outgrew that, now no one thinks that way anymore. So I think that you can have people who have absorbed this kind of wisdom and who can communicate it to others, can communicate its results to others, even if they don't have, if they're not on the cutting edge of the verbal Torah information, of course, again, they can't be ignoramuses. And the people who think that they were ignoramuses are just prejudiced. But that's not where all of Torah understanding lies. It doesn't only lie in book learning. Got a question? Interacting with a rough because I heard like when you speak to a big rough, they have like a sort of rough 
Makudr, and it can relate to you what the best answer would be for Makudr Baruch. So I, I think that's right. The idea of Ruach HaKodesh is a lower level of divine inspiration than prophecy. And it makes a big difference legally. You're not bound to follow someone with Ruach HaKodesh the way you're bound to follow a prophet and so forth and so on. On the other hand, you are getting an, imp, an, an input coming from HaKodesh Baruch But I'm saying something more radical. Let's, let's, let's take a situation in that thousand years. Ruven is a prophet. Shimon is his next door neighbor. They interact with each other. And then Levi gets to know Shimon and is affected by, the, by, by Shimon. Even Levi is now being affected by the behavior of Ruvain the prophet. It's a, ch it's a chain that has an effect. Of course, it's, it's diluted when you go down the chain. No question about it. But it's not zero. It's not zero. You're communicating this kind of nonverbal grasp of what the Torah wants from uh, you know from from this uh, from this kind of this kind of background now uh, i'll give you uh, an example where you'll see that this happens to be a chassidish um where you'll see why you need to have both types of learning but but without the one you won't you won't be able, you won't be able to get it uh, a, a a woman came Friday morning to the Rav. She had a chicken, and she was afraid maybe it was treif, and she wanted him to ask him whether she could use it for Shabbos or not. At the time that she came, the Rav was sitting and teaching his, his disciples. So he saw her come in. He knew what she wanted, and he said, I'll get to you. Wait, please, over there, and I'll, I'll get to you. No, a half hour goes by, an hour goes by, and he's still teaching his disciples. She's getting nervous because in a certain period of time, the, the market's going to close. And if he passes that it's treif, it's going to be very difficult for her to get a, get a chicken before Shabbos. And then he keeps going on, and then finally he calls her over and says, it's kosher, no problem. So she leaves, and the Talmudim say to the Rav, why did you do that? Why did you make her wait? What, what, was, what was going on there? He said, when she walked in, I already saw what the problem was. Now, when you look up in the Shulchan Aruch, you'll see that a problem like this is a split, a split decision. Some say it's kosher, some say it's treif. But the majority opinion is, because it's a split decision, if it's too difficult to replace, then you're allowed to rule leniently and say it's kosher. So if I had answered her when she walked in the door when she could easily have gone to the shuk, she would have had to get another chicken. But I waited until it would be too difficult for her. And then I could, according to the way the law is structured, I could say to her that it's kosher and she could use it. Now, even if you had observed this with your own eyes, if you didn't get his explanation, you would have, you would never understood what you saw. You just see she was in distress and uh, she was caused pain. But now what you learned is how to evaluate a law, and how to take into account the practical circumstances, because the law can change because the law takes into account those practical circumstances. So it, it's this kind of experience. Now I want you to know, when we train postkim, a postkim is someone who answers questions of Jewish law. When it's done right, you don't just take an exam. You don't just take an exam. You sit with a posek for years. You sit there and listen to the questions he gets and, and his answers. I have a fr friend who trained by Rabbi Moshe Halberstam, took us out of the bracha. For years he sat there and listened to him answer questions. And then when you do that, you, you, I'll give you two examples of what of things that he learned, which I know would ne would never have uh, occurred to me. He was sitting there. It was it was uh, people calling up about the question: Should they eat? Shouldn't they eat? Medical conditions and stuff and so on. A person calls up, and the rav says to him, "Yes, you should eat. I'm not hanging up until I hear your bracha." Oh, 
So it's not enough to paskin, especially that a person should eat on Tisha B'Av. Because even though you say you should eat, the person will say, yeah, but am I really hungry? Am I dizzy yet? You know, am I feeling fit? No. Oh, I'll try to stick it out for another hour. I'll try to stick it out for another two hours. And he knows that. He also knows that if he makes a bracha, he's going to eat. He's not going to risk making a, a bracha of a toa. So he says, not hanging up till you, till you, uh, till you make a bracha. In another case, a boy be became religious. He was here in yeshiva and his parents are not religious at all, and they're coming to visit him for Pesach. Mm, what am I going to do with my parents for Pesach? You know, and they're coming from Chutzlarz, usually they have to keep two days when everybody else here is keeping one day, and that means they can't travel and so on and so on, and it's Pesach, Matzah, and everything else. Uh, what should I do? What should I do? And he went to a Rav, and the Rav said, two days, and they can't travel, and they have to eat matzah, and I mean, so he, okay, he went to the Rav, and he got upset, but he was in terrible, terrible distress. So he came to Rav Moshe Halberstam, which, by the way, contrary to popular belief, you are allowed to do. You are allowed to go and ask a second opinion. Only, when you go to ask a second opinion, you have to tell the Rav, I already asked this question of so-and-so, and this is what he said. And then the second Rav can, can decide whether he should uh, interfere or shouldn't interfere. Let me just finish the case and I'll take your question. <coughs> so he told the whole story to Rav Rosh HaBashtab. My friend was there and saw this. Rosh HaBashtab said, that's not a psak. That's not a psak. Okay, if I were really cruel, I'd let you think about it for a week to try to figure out why it's not a psak. And you can ask some of your clever friends why it's not a psak. The answer is very simple. His parents didn't tell him to go and ask a question for them. He just made it up. The psak wasn't for him. The psak was for his parents. He can't bind his parents because he asked a question on their behalf. So it's not a psak, period. Methodologically, it's not a psak. As I say, I never would have, I never would have dreamt of that. <laughs> You can't force a psak on somebody else. I don't know what happened afterwards in terms of the uh, details of the case. But when you sit there for years and hear a major posik answer questions, you learn a great deal. You learn how he answers. You learn when he's, his attitude is rough and when his attitude is, is uh, forgiving. Um, it, it's, uh, it, that's the kind of training that a person has to have because observing the actual practice gives you understanding that you then then otherwise have and by the way just again for, for people who aren't aware of this women call and ask their questions also and th uh, there are lines open basically 24 6. once one of my daughters called a post like at 2 th 2 30 in the morning because she had something that had to be answered right away and she started by apologizing. He said, don't apologize. Because if you apologize, next time you'll be reluctant to call. Don't apologize. You have a question, you call. A great, great post many had separate waiting rooms. A waiting room for men, a waiting room for women. And they would alternate. Take a man in, answer his question. Take a woman in, answer her question. You know. They're, 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 uh, they are available to women just as they're available to men. Yeah, you, ha you wanted to add something? Yes. Um, many times I've done the second opinion thing because something seemed off. The problem is, is that every time I go out of my way, and this is every single time, every rabbi I talk to that I, I mention other names, like, I, I don't hear about what other people have to say. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see you who said whatever. Because he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to think badly about that person. But the problem is that I feel, while I understand the whole thing about going out of way to get a second opinion, I don't fully. Uh, many times I've gotten like pushback on mentioning the names of that first opinion I got to the second opinion. Well, first of all, you could just put that into the question. I say, listen, I want you to know that I have asked this question of someone else. And I'm happy to tell you who it was and what he said, if you feel that that's necessary. I find it a little odd 
It, it depends about what it is you want to say. If, if you are asking a question whether it's us or a mutter, it seems to me that the second Rav needs to know whether he told you it was us or a mutter. Now, as far as argumentation and reasoning and so forth and so on, uh, I hope this doesn't stare you too much, but there's absolutely no reason that the second Rav should trust your report of what he said. Absolutely no reason for him to trust that. So, you know, at that point, I would say also, you know, okay, spare me. Thank you very much. You know, I don't know if he said that or not. But, but I think that because if he told you it's us, sir, it's more difficult for the second one to say that it's mutter. But if the first one said it's mutter, it's... That's right. That's right. Because he's now freeing you from an obligation by saying it's mutter. He can do it, Usually, he'd have to find some pretty clear mistake in what the person did, which he may know that that may be. Um, the other thing is whether it, it depends on whether you ask the first one as a strict halacha, I want to know the halacha, versus asking his opinion or versus asking him for an etza, you know, just a, a advice as to, as to what to do. <coughs> there, there's no problem at all. Yeah, yeah, not only, even though if you have to tell the second one that you that you, but if you ask Allah uh, Shaila, it's a it's a tricky thing to be able to um, go and ask the second question. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about the perhaps Hasidic emphasis on the non-verbal Torah, it would be almost remiss not to mention the singing and the dancing. I was wondering if you could expound on that a little bit on the centrality of the singing and singing and dancing in Hasidic circles and its its deeper significance okay this is this is a general a general um, it's a general type of consideration where you you're talking about relative emphasis um, King David wrote a verse that we say every morning if do us Hashem simple serve God with joy If you organize your life correctly, every moment of every day is spent serving God. We've talked about this. Service of God divides into mitzvos and necess necessities for mitzvos. And a well-organized life, that's all you're ever doing. Either doing mitzvos or you're doing something necessary to be able to do mitzvos. Joy is joy. Right? Um, you ask the average person when you put on tefillin in the morning, when you bench after breakfast, when you uh, give it stuckers over and so on, how often does your pulse rate go up 10 points? How often does your breathing change? You're telling me you're doing what King David said to do? Really? I think most people would sort of wave their hands and say, well, well, you know, can't have everything. Okay, maybe so. But suppose somebody who says, in our circles, simcha is very important, and we believe that it has to be stimulated. We believe that it has to have, have, have uh, actual, actual expression for it. King David lived a long time ago. He's very, very respected authority. It's just a question of are you taking that seriously as part of your daily, your daily um, service of God? So, um, if I remember correctly, the Kuzuri says that a person can be gri gripped by simcha to the point where he spontaneously starts to sing and dance. So it's not it's not a, a foreign element. It's a question of emphasis. Now. Together with Simcha, there's also what's called Kovid Rosh. Kovid Rosh means um, a kind of seriousness and focus. So that, for example, when you do something, if you are challenged, why are you doing that? You should have a reason. <clears throat> you should have thought it out. You should have weighed it. And often, Kovid Rosh on the one hand and Simcha on the other hand are in tension with one another. Okay, so they are intention. So then you'll have to decide what to give priority to. Different people and different times have different, different priorities. 
um, Pesach, Sukkot, the intermediary days of the festival. There are people who make sure to have a festive meal every day. That means meat, wine, friends, singing, dancing, every day. Well, it says, So what did you do? You spent extra time in the base measures? Was your pulse racing? Right? Were you sweating? Were you, were you, breathing, hot? Were you breathing heavy? Because of the very difficult Rabbi Kivager? Maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe you're one of those people for whom learning is the greatest simcha. Maybe. Maybe. And maybe not. And maybe, somehow, simcha is not on your, not on your, on your list of priorities. You know? You're not going to invest a lot in simcha. I'm not saying what you're doing is wrong, but you shouldn't say that what they're doing is wrong. Because they're investing in a mitzvah. A mitzvah that's a chiyuv. So I think that's where, where singing and, and dancing come from. You know, l'cha uh, doidi. My Rebbe Zatzal sang a lot. He, he believed in it. He believed in the dancing also. And if you, if you sing l'cha doidi, let's say for 10 minutes, and you're just, you're, as they say, ba'ananim, you're in the clouds. And then you come into Shema of, of, of Friday night with that spirit, that's definitely worth doing. Again, other things are worth doing also, and that's a trade-off, but there's no question that it's worth doing. So I think that's the, uh, uh, the idea there. The idea of, of, of singing and dancing, no question about it. Okay, so the bottom line that I, that I came to, which is probably obvious to you, is when you ask somebody how to live Yiddishkeit, what to do, what to develop, you want somebody who not only knows the books, but also has this nonverbal understanding. And largely that's gotten by being associated with others who have it. And if, if that person can give guidance to other people how they should develop their Yiddishkeit, how they should develop their, their, practice, uh, their practice of Torah because they have this nonverbal understanding. Now again, I'm not, not saying that there's only in the Hasidic movement, but someone wants to disqualify the Hasidic movement because this person doesn't know every Toysus and Shas by heart. It would be nice to know every Toysus and Shas by heart, but if you don't also have this nonverbal uh, one of the Gedolim of the 20th century was quoted as saying later on in life that he regrets the way he conducted his Shabbos table because he ate as quickly as possible and went back to the base medrash and he felt it was a mistake. Now, obviously he had not been in contact with someone who conducted Shabbos table the way later on in life he felt that he should have. Had he been in contact with such a person, then maybe he, later he wouldn't have regretted it. He'd have done it in the way that he later came to feel was important. So, so this is the, this, this nonverbal area, which is, which is extremely important. It has to do with, with also with being a, a, a tzibur, a society where things are done together with a large group of people maybe we'll talk about that tomorrow <clears throat> it's not just one on one but there's a certain you probably have heard the phrase Barovam Hadras Melech in the multitude of the people is the glory of the king experiencing the glory of the king is one of the things that Yiddishkai would have you do the Torah wants you to experience the glory of the king that means that you should do mitzvahs together with groups of people. And the larger the group of people, that, that, in that respect, the better the mitzvah is. The Hasidic movement stressed doing mitzvahs together with, with, a, with a community, sometimes a very big community. That's something which also, a person who's sitting and learning all by himself, the base medrash, it's a dimension that he's giving up. He may have good reason to give it up, but others may have good reason to, to, to uh, emphasize it and to, and to uh, make use of it. Okay.